Hello, everyone. I appreciate if you uh, appreciate you watching. If you have more interest in this PTSD uh, project I was doing this past year, um, it's kind of a tradition that I do a project for each deployment that I go on. And this last deployment, uh, this turned out to be the project. Uh, this is part three. Um, I've been way behind. Uh, behind the eight ball as far as time. Uh, I wanted this finished up last year, but uh, that's why I decided to make a video instead of just to keep writing about it. If you want to know how it came about, um, they're on LinkedIn. The, uh, there are links to part one and two. Uh, so what I'm going to do is give you an overview using this video showing the completion of the project. Um, the, the, the name of the project is PTSD, uh, which is a tongue-in-cheek uh, acronym for Portable Threat and Security Device. Uh, if anything, it's a good example of scope creep. Um, but uh, originally the challenge early in 2019, uh, the personal challenge that I came up with was to see what I could do to to mimic uh, uh, the socking of an environment or the penetration testing or of an environment or something like that using a, uh, a device that had to fit into this particular case. This is a, a Pelican P100 pistol case. And as you can see, it, uh, it does constrain you um, with space. So. I'm kind of weird like that. I decided to constrain myself at the beginning to a particular uh, container and then make all of my requirements fit into that. The original requirements are listed in, in part one on the web. Uh, a lot of those requirements, uh, a couple of those requirements uh, went away, but uh, certainly a lot more were added. So I'm going to try to go by memory here and give you uh, an overview of what this system does when it's when it's working properly, and some of the challenges that I had building it. Um, so let's start with the case. I, you know, uh, the case is the, the pistol case itself. So my original idea was to obviously use every every bit of that I could by placing the monitor in the in the lid so this is a this is a touch screen 14 inch monitor no, I'm sorry it, it's either 10 or 11 inch monitor uh, but it does have touch screen capability so I, I ordered that I um, throughout the project I had to do a few modifications to the case itself and uh, mostly through these M5 socket head hex screws uh, are what I use to go through the case to secure a lot of the equipment in here. Uh, so that was my first hurdle, was getting this, this monitor um, positioned in the lid and secured with four, uh, four screws. Uh, behind the monitor here, uh, it has its own uh, card for the touchscreen, um, uh, as well. Um, there was there was extra room back there, so I placed uh, one Raspberry Pi four back here uh, behind the monitor, uh, and there's also uh, I had two Alpha wireless cards, uh, so I took the the Alpha wireless cards apart from their case uh, and mounted those cards, uh, one card behind here in the lid as well. So a lot of things happening here behind the lid. We've got, uh, we've got power to the main display. We've got a um, antenna cable from that wireless card, ported down here and out again through the case 
to an external antenna. We have a four port USB hub coming off the one of the Pi the Pi in the back. We have power for the Pi itself. We have power for the antenna card. And uh, we have two ways of getting Ethernet from that Raspberry Pi. We have uh, uh, the built-in Cat45 uh, off of the Pi, and we also have uh, one of the USB ports serving as a, a gig gigabit to USB adapter on that Pi. And I misspoke. There, there's two Alpha cards behind here. One, one of the alpha cars serves each pie. So this, this antenna here is coming down to a pie that I'll show you later, the second pie in the case. Um, again, as you might uh, deduce is the, the red and the green, obviously. Uh, my plan was to have two networks that would never touch each other. Uh, green being uh, admin use, you know, a trusted system. And the red being system that you might ingest uh, a variety of ways by Wi-Fi, by direct connection, or Bluetooth. And the way that I envisioned, uh, the, the way the Wi-Fi would be captured would be by each of these antennas, one's 5, one's 2.4 megahertz. Uh, so that's that should be obvious, but the other the way the what I call you know what we what we call the unknown or the suspect network would come in through the the red Ethernet cable, and to accomplish that, I uh, I found these um, through through ports for Cat 45. Um, uh, I drilled these out and placed these here. That way, uh, with with you know some regular extension cables, I I can have my suspect internet come in, uh, go through uh, a splitter or a tap, uh, and send it in a variety of configurations where I want it to go. Um, let's say I brought it in. I want to I want to monitor that data and send it right back out, so the the end user would would be. Uh, would not know anything else was was happening, or I can bring it in and not send it back out. I can make copies of it, things like that. And then there's one or two ports you could use for your trusted data if you wanted to go wired and things like that. So there's a couple configurations that these external ports allow. Uh, back up on the Raspberry Pi and the lid. Naturally, if you know Raspberry Pis, you have your SD cards. Um, they're right on the right on the on the circuit card, so you have to have physical access. Uh, that there's one SD card that that takes you know that is the hard drive of the Pi. So I use these micro SD to USB ribbon adapters, so I can change out my cards um, without disassembling the whole thing again um, which if you mess with Raspberry Pis you know uh, it's stable but not really that stable so you find yourself experimenting with different OS's you're going to be removing and, and changing your SD cards out uh, so one of these goes to the main Raspberry Pi port for SD cards, the other one goes to a uh, another uh, micro SD to USB adapter and serves as a way to take backups of the Pi through uh, your chosen backup program. So these are just Velcroed, Velcroed on here, uh, easy access to to change. And these here, uh, there's Two for two for each um, each Pi, uh, so the but each uh, card is 200 gig. So each Pi has a 
200 gig card with 200 gig backup. Um, the the touchscreen is working. I, I have it disconnected right now, uh, but depending on what your configuration is, naturally you're gonna use your touchscreen for here and then your external mouse and uh, keyboard. Right now I'm using a wired mouse and keyboard, but you could get a, one of your little micro uh, Bluetooth mouse and keyboards was my plan. Okay, so uh, moving along, uh, naturally, if we want to keep these green and red networks separate, um, I started out with, I found these really nice um, mini switches uh, made by Black Box. Very cool uh, eight port switches. And I just eventually went with two of those, one for trust and one for untrust. And uh, one of the things that that popped up was the amount of cables, you know, that uh, typically six foot long. And rather than having a, a gigantic mess in here, I started uh, cutting the cables and doing my own soldering. Uh, for example, here is um, the power uh, adapters for these two switches. I got these, um, these uh, I think it's a 3.5 millimeter barrel connector to uh, individual wire connectors and I just clipped off the ends of the USB so I have like a one inch USB cable powering each switch um, so for for visual um, you would also need to be able to switch back and forth between each Pi so I'm utilizing a HDMI splitter here. This cable goes to the main um, uh, display and then from here I go to back to each Raspberry Pi. So I can go from from or, or what we're looking at here is the Raspberry Pi in the lid trying to boot up. Like I said, I, every time I start it I have different problems. Uh, but that would be two. And then one, um, I, I have Ubuntu running here uh, and it doesn't want to cooperate right now. Uh, but but uh, talking about OS is the, the concept of operations. Um, and I tried many different OSs from CentOS um, to uh, Red Hat to Fedora, all, all kinds of different things. And even the, the native Raspberry Pi actually worked the best, but I wanted to try to try to push the limits of, with OS's a little bit, but anyway, what I uh, what I finally found was um, I'm going to use uh, the concept would be that the the lower pie, what I'll call the lower pie, would be for management of the system, storing storing logs and administration, basically the green network, and then the red network would be run here on uh, uh, Kali Linux on the pie in the in the lid. And that would be where you you can do all your your testing and exploring, um, and eventually send logs to the lower Pi to be evaluated with Kibana or something like that. So to support to, to continue to support these two systems, um, I have two. Uh, two little uh, travel routers. I think these are called the Mango um, travel routers. They're pretty pretty capable uh, USB powder powered routers. Again, one for one for the red network and one for the green. I also have uh, using the uh, Great Scott gadgets here with this it's a throwing star land tap to split up my red data, depending on where I want it, to, want it to go, which configuration I want. So again, as you, you can probably feel my pain when I started out, I, I was just gonna have one Pi, one router, one switch, and go from there, and then things just kept doubling. Uh, so I had to go with um, 
a USB hub for each each pi. So this hub goes to the lid, this hub goes to pi number, the lower pi right here. So on the on the on the Cali Pi I can use my uh, Bluetooth antenna here as well as these two antennas. So for power, um, I decided uh, after a couple experiments on, we have an eight port um, USB charger. Uh, it actually, actually does pretty good when all the stars align, I can get both systems booted up and working and be able to switch back and forth. Let's see. When, when I initially put the uh, started adding all the electronics into the lid, it started getting very hot back there. So I decided to put. I found a five volt fan and cut a hole in the lid here and installed this five volt fan to evacuate that heat. And it does a pretty good job. I have it turned off right now. Um, but that's a lot of stuff right in, right in the lid, and it, but it's all working sometimes. So let's see, what else can I talk about? Um, one of the, the big challenges of doing this, you know, I, I wasn't in my garage. I didn't have a lot of tools except for the ones I borrowed. So I was borrowing a soldering gun, a drill. I actually ordered individual uh, hole saws uh, that I needed to, to make these holes, uh, heat gun, shrink wrap, all, all kinds of things, glue. Uh, I even shortened the, the 120 volt power cable, if you can see that. Uh, this power turned out pretty good. This, this is a it's an aircraft style kind of cannon plug type uh, connector. It's a two pin connector for AC. So I used that and cut the, cut the six foot cord, wall cord from the power supply and adapted it to a two pin. Uh, and then I have this really nice cord that I found in a McMaster car. It's kind of a heavy duty and that's uh, six feet or eight feet to the wall. Yeah, so it was important that I only had one, uh, many sources of requirements for power, but I, w I only wanted one output for power. And uh, again, that, that is a through plug right here with a gasket. The, uh, one of the original requirements as well was that anything that I used had to fit in the case and the case had to close and I almost made it um, with this keyboard. Uh, this keyboard fit initially but uh, after I started expanding it would no longer fit so I, I can close the case with everything except the mouse and the keyboard but I think if I get a, a foldable Bluetooth mouse and keyboard I can, I can get that lid to close. But what's cool about it is you can when you're ready to pack up you just take everything and wrap it up and put it in your in your case. Uh, I used some. Um, this is a half inch um, foam insulation, plumbing insulation, and I just used that for to wrap around the bezel to get some positive air through airflow through the fan and negative airflow behind there and I'm probably forgetting a bunch of things but it was uh, it was really exciting um, the OS's were a lot of work it took a lot of time to just when I found you know I would get something working it would come back the next day and something wrong so I kept evaluating different OS's, um, but eventually uh, I have what I have now. So I think it's a it's a good uh, it's a good little project. Kept me busy for a year. Um, 
why did I do it? Why, you know, uh, why didn't I just use a MacBook Pro and a, and a couple of antennas? Oh, you could, uh, but then, you know, you'd be, you'd be, uh, you wouldn't have a project. So that's what we have. What are your questions? No, I'm just kidding. If you have any questions, let me know. I'm happy to explain or try to explain what I've done here. Uh, if, it, if anything, it's rugged. You know, so there it is. Thank you for listening. Have a good year. Bye.